Um, it's really a pleasure to be able to, to teach and be involved in medical student education. It's something I'm very passionate about. And I'll just say, you know, take advantage of these resources um, on the Neurosurgery Training Center. Uh, this wasn't available when I was a medical student. I really wish it was. And um, so I hope you all take advantage of it. It's a tremendous asset. Now, for my talk today, I, I thought I'd cap off our um, series on pituitary adenomas uh, that has just been terrific by, by real leaders in the field um, and talk about surgical anatomy and common postoperative issues. And so my goal for today um, is to review the anatomy of the cellar and paracellar region with you. Um, I want you guys to be able to understand the radiographic anatomy of the cellar and paracellar region and understand how uh, presenting symptoms correlate with the anatomy that we'll all learn together. And finally, I want you all to understand the common postoperative issues related to endoscopic endonasal surgery uh, for common tumors of the cellar and paracellar uh, region. Now, taken all together, uh, if I could boil it down to one goal for today, it's really I want to make sure that um, all the students on the call um, are superstars on their sub internships and their rotations here, uh, you know, wherever you go to school. Um, I hope this talk will be high yield for you. Um, I'm going to make sure that there's a lot of repetition so that, you know, we all get the basic anatomy down and then everything will kind of grow from there. Um, so please feel free to interrupt with any questions and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so again, recommended resources. Um, if you are interested in this topic, I would really recommend going back and, uh, you know, watching all the lectures by the distinguished panel that um, the 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 group has put together. Um, these are inter internationally recognized surgeons, and I really recommend um, checking out their, their talks. So I thought I'd start uh, before diving into the anatomy um, with, I think, the perfect piece of art um, that describes the modern skull-based surgeon. So this is M.C. Escher's wood carving called Relativity. Um, and you can see that depending on how you look at it, the staircases, the folks going up and down, um, you know, it really just depends on the angle that you look at it and, you know, the, rel the relative angles that you're at. And that's absolutely true with skull-based surgery and especially for surgery of the cellar and paracellar region. And you'll come to see that in just, uh, you know, the next few slides. So diving into the anatomy, we'll take it in layers. And I thought we'd start with the skull base anatomy. So to start, um, we're looking uh, from the top of the head into the skull base uh, with the brain, the nerves, the arteries, the veins all removed. So we're just looking at bone here. And we'll start by looking at the anterior cranial fossa. So anterior cranial fossa, those uh, yellow highlighted squares are just above the orbit. So we call that the orbital roof. And in the midline anterior cranial fossa, most anterior, uh, we have the cribriform plate. We have the planum sphenoidale, just posterior to that. And the tuberculum is like the ledge that falls into the cella. Now this behind the cella is the dorsum cella and it's made up of the posterior clinoids. And we'll see more of those uh, throughout the talk. Now, laterally, you'll see the lateral sphenoid wing and that merges into the anterior clinoid. All of these structures we'll learn throughout the talk. Now the optic canal uh, is the superior lateral border of the cella in an anatomical um, area that we need to be very mindful of for surgery of this region. And obviously the cella, which contains the pituitary gland. Now, if we start adding layers to this, so we start adding dural layers and soft tissue, you can see again, uh, nothing's changed. This is the orbital roof of the anterior cranial fossa. In the midline, you have the cribriform plate. Just posterior, you have the planum sphenoid alley. And finally, the tuberculum cella, which again, I want you to remember, is the cliff that falls into the cella. We have the lateral sphenoid wing, which then goes into the anterior clinoid. And you can start to see some of the soft tissue structures as well now. So you can see the optic nerve and optic chiasm, and that goes through the optic canal. 
And again, you can relate your skull base anatomy to these foramina. You know that the anterior clinoid uh, is superior lateral to the optic canal. Um, and so when you're working from an endonasal perspective, you're always keeping that in mind. Now, on top of the optic chiasm are the A1 segments of the ACAs. Um, and so that anatomy will never change. And we'll go over that a few times today. Um, so from deep to superficial, from an extracranial view, you have your pituitary gland, your optic chiasm, and your A1 segments uh, of the ACA. Now, if we zoom in a little bit and look from the side, Again, just to orient everyone, this is the anterior clinoid, which is the medial most aspect of the sphenoid wing. If there's an anterior clinoid, there must be a posterior clinoid. And again, the posterior clinoids together make up the dorsum cella. You can see the optic canal, uh, which is just inframedial to the anterior clinoid. We know that the lateral border of the optic canal is the optic strut. And it's the optic strut that separates the optic canal from the superior orbital fissure. And I'm not going to go through exactly which nerves and structures flow through the more lateral foramina. Um, we can save that for another talk on another day um, since we're focused on the midline. But it's good to know um, those structures as you think about an, a, a transcranial approach to this region. Now, if we were to zoom in um, on this area, again, the, for orientation, this is the anterior clinoid. Just medial to the anterior clinoid is the optic canal. The optic strut separates the optic canal from the superior orbital fissure. So same anatomy as the picture on the left. We're just zoomed in um, so you can really see those skull base foramina and bony structures. Now let's look from a more midline view. Again, we're extracranial looking down on the skull base. Um, so we, knew, we know from some of the first images we looked at together that this represents the planum sphenoid alley, the floor of the anterior cranial fossa. As we go more posterior on the skull base, that's the tuberculum, which represents the cliff that falls into the cella. We know the lateral aspects are the anterior clinoids. And finally, most posteriorly within the midline, we have the dorsum cella, which is made up of the posterior clinoids. Finally, the pituitary fossa or cella is right in front of the dorsum cella and right behind the tuberculum. Now we've seen this picture before, again, looking from the side. So orienting each other, we have the anterior clinoid or the medial most aspect of the sphenoid wing. We have the posterior clinoids making up the dorsum cella. And those mark the borders of the cella without any of the soft tissue structures there. So as students um, of neurosurgery, not only are you gonna have to understand anatomy, but you're gonna have to understand radiographic anatomy as well. So this is a sagittal view of a CT scan, and we'll correlate the anatomy that we've learned in these prosections with this imaging. So if you can see my cursor here, the most and we're in the midline. You can see the nose right here. Um, the most anterior aspect of the midline anterior cranial fossa is the cribriform, cribriform plate, just posterior planum sphenoid alley. And then finally, the tuberculum. Again, the cliff that falls off into the cella. You can see the cella here where the pituitary gland resides. And then finally, you can see the dorsum cella or the posterior cline made up of the posterior clinoids right here. So I hope that helps to correlate the prosections with the radiographic anatomy that will, uh, you will inevitably have to interpret. So now let's look at the radiographic anatomy from a superior view. So again, we've learned um, all our midline anatomy. And as we scroll down to the skull base, you can see the sphenoid wing here going into the most medial aspect of the anterior clinoids. You can see the optic canal start to form here, just medial to the anterior clinoid on the screen left, patient right. And if we were to scroll here, 
you can make out the optic canal over here. The planum would be in this region, tuberculum right here, the, po the dorsum cella back here made up of the posterior clinoids, and the cella is right here. And this cut pretty accurately reflects the anatomy that you're seeing on the pro section on the left side. Now let's start adding some soft tissue structures to this. Um, so again, we're looking at a very similar view. We've just added skull base dura, and we've added some soft tissue structures that we'll go through. So to start, again, the midline anterior cranial fossa is the planum sphenoid alley. Just posterior is the tuberculum cella, the cliff that falls into the cella. Posteriorly, you have the dorsum cella with the posterior clinoids. So we know that skull base anatomy. And now let's start adding soft tissue structures. So within the cella, you can see the pituitary gland here or the, you know, the infundibulum, which had been cut. And superior to the uh, pituitary gland, like we saw in some of the first slides, is the optic nerve. And you can see the optic nerves going through the optic canal. And then the next pattern never changes. And that's true whether you're going through a transcranial approach or endoscopic approach, the orientation of these structures doesn't change. So just inferolateral to the optic nerves is the carotid artery on both sides. And inferolateral to that is the oculomotor nerve going through the oculomotor triangle into the cavernous sinus. Now let's go back to our prosections. And as we look from a transcranial approach, you can see the optic chiasm going through the optic canal. Lateral to that is the internal carotid artery going into the ICA terminus, branching into the MCA and ACA branches. Those are shown there, the MCA and ACA. And remember, we talked about ACAs always drape over the optic chiasm. Now let's turn 180 degrees. Uh, so previously we were looking forward with the skull. Now we're gonna be looking straight at the skull. So we're as if we're standing in front of this uh, cadaver's face and looking down into the brain via subfrontal approach. So we've raised the frontal lobes and by raising the frontal lobes, that's cranial nerve one, olfactory nerve. And we can see the anatomy that we're starting to all learn. So the optic chiasm and optic nerves, again, the nerves are coming towards us into the screen. Lateral to the optic nerves and optic chiasm is the internal carotid artery going into the ICA terminus. Posteriorly projecting uh, branches include the PCOM and anterior choroidal branches. And then finally, draped over the top of the optic chiasm are the A1 segments merging at the ACOM and then uh, going posteriorly with the A2 branches. Finally, you can see the MCAs going laterally. And then inferiorly to the optic chiasm is the pituitary gland. And what we're seeing there is the infundibulum. You cannot see the pituitary gland uh, in this prosection here, uh, rather just the stalk leading to the gland, but it's the same orientation. And then how about a lateral approach? So imagine we're coming in via terional approach. The anatomy is the same. And the purpose of going over all of this is just to give a 360 degree view of the anatomies because the anatomy doesn't change. It's just the, it just depends on where you're standing. Again, that MC Escher would sketch. Um, so again, when we lift up the frontal lobe via subfrontal approach, you can see the olfactory nerve going out to the cribriform plate. If you follow the olfactory nerve straight back, that will leave you to the optic nerve and optic chiasm. Just posteriorly to the optic, or I'm sorry, just laterally to the optic chiasm is the carotid artery. Again, the posteriorly projecting branches include the PCOM and anterior choroidal branches. The carotid artery, after bifurcating at the ICA terminus, medially will be the A1 segments, which will drape over the optic chiasm. And then finally, you can see the third nerve, which is inferolateral to the carotid artery. So again, in the midline, you have 
the optic chiasm and optic nerve, carotid artery inferolateral, and third nerve inferolateral to that. Now let's look from the other side. So we were looking from the patient's left. Now we're looking from the patient's right. So what you can see again, optic chiasm, the carotid artery, which runs lateral to the optic nerve, the A1 segment, which drapes over the optic chiasm. And you can see that when we zoom in. Again, optic chiasm, carotid artery, the pituitary stalk or infundibulum. And if we zoom in even further, again, you see optic nerve, optic chiasm, carotid artery, um, and this bottom left panel uh, is actually critical when you're doing a transcranial approach because when you come in, say from the patient's right side, the contralateral carotid artery is actually going to be medial to the contralateral optic nerve. So you want to be very mindful of that. Say you have a tuberculum cella meningioma um, or a giant pituitary adenoma that you're taking out from a transcranial approach. You want to be mindful that when you're working underneath the contralateral optic nerve, that the carotid artery will come closer to you on the contralateral side. It's not um, pushed away from you. So always important to keep in mind. And that there is the ophthalmic artery. All right. So let's start to correlate some of these findings with uh, radiographic anatomy. So I have a couple of prosections shown on the left, and I have a couple MRI slices shown on the right. And what you can see, again, the optic chiasm and optic nerves. And when we look at the MRI, it's the same structures. And you just have to understand um, the relationship of these structures to each other. So optic chiasm is in the midline, just lateral to the optic chiasm and optic nerves are the carotid arteries. And those are lateral here on the MRI. Similarly, when we look in coronal section, again, we're, look, we're standing in front of the prosection, looking backwards. You can see the optic chiasm here, which is shown here on the MRI. Lateral to the optic chiasm is the carotid arteries, which you see here. Draped over the optic chiasm are the A1 segments of the ACAs. You can see that on the MRI. So the relationship does not change. Um, finally, you can see the infundibulum leading to the pituitary gland, and you see that there on the MRI. And it's important to be able to find these structures on normal studies. And so to all the students, if you're taking a neuroradiology rotation or looking at scans on your sub eyes, always make sure to just look at the normal scans and try and identify normal anatomy. Because when it comes time for when a giant skull base tumor is there, the meningioma, pituitary adenoma, craniopharyngioma, which we'll all look at a little later, um, the relationships don't change, but you need to know where those structures are so you keep the patient safe during surgery. So now we've learned our transcranial anatomy. Let's kind of flip around and see what everything looks like from inside the nose. Um, so this is an endoscopic view of the skull base. Um, it's a classic picture. I would recommend all the students screenshot this um, and commit this to memory because you will be pimped on this multiple times. Uh, this will be on your board exam. Um, and should you decide to be a skull base surgeon, this is something you will look at day in and day out. Um, so again, we're parked inside the nose with an endoscope looking at the bottom side of the skull. And there's a series of bumps, bridges, holes um, that will correlate with all the anatomy that we learned uh, looking from a transcranial approach. So we'll start here, which is the face of the cella. You just got to take me at, at face value there that that's where the pituitary gland resides. And let me tell you how I know that. So if that's the face of the cella, we know that the cliff that leads to the cella from the midline anterior cranial fossa is the tuberculum. Just above the tuberculum is the planum, planum sphenoidale. Again, that's the midline. So as we go back, backwards, 
from a transcranial approach, um, again, planum sphenoidale, tuberculum, and then the cella. But when we're looking from the nose, everything's backwards. So we're looking at the cella, then the tuberculum, then the planum. <clears throat> now remember, lateral to the cella is where the carotid arteries reside. And you can always see bilateral protuberances of that, the carotid protuberance. Now we know that medial to the carotid artery is the optic nerves, and you can make out the optic canal, the wall of the optic canal there. Now, the space between the carotid arteries and the optic nerve is the OCR, the optico-carotid recess, and that represents the optic strut. Um, so that's an important landmark when you're doing endoscopic surgery um, to be able to identify the anatomy almost as if you're able to see through bone, and it's all based on those subtle bumps and ridges and bridges uh, that you see. Now, this is what I think about when I'm doing endoscopic surgery. I'm looking at the skull base, but in my mind's eye, again, face of the cella, tuberculum, carotids, optic nerve, OCR. In my mind, this is what I'm thinking about. I'm trying to erase all of that bone and look at the structures immediately behind it. Now, oftentimes this bone is paper thin. And so you have to be really mindful with your instruments, um, not to poke holes and know exactly where you are at all times, um, because you don't want to find yourself with a carotid artery injury um, and bone overlying it. So with the bone away, again, you can see in the midline, the pituitary gland, the carotid arteries lateral to that, the optic nerves superior. And that is why I always think about this MC Escher work, um, because it all depends of your where you are and how you're looking at the patient's anatomy. So on the patient's left, again, you see a transcranial approach, I call a subfrontal approach, and you see the olfactory nerves, the optic chiasm and optic nerves, laterally, the carotid arteries, the PCOMs, the A1 segments, and the A2 segments. The MCAs are going laterally, and infundibulum is leading down into the pituitary gland. Now, if we were to look for an endoscopic view, a more infero to superior view, you would see the pituitary gland, and you'd see the carotids laterally, and you'd see the optic chiasm on top of the gland, on top of the you know, infundibulum. So let's start to put this into practice. Um, so this is a surgical video uh, that I did uh, with my fellowship director, Dr. Zada at USC as a fellow. Um, and we'll kind of walk through it um, and show you the approach to the cella um, and how we do surgery there. So this is a patient um, who had um, acromegaly or a growth hormone secreting pituitary adenoma. You can see the MRI scans here and we'll pause just for a second to review the anatomy. So on the far left, we see a coronal section. Again, we know that the optic chiasm is right here. It's right above the infundibulum and the pituitary gland is pushed off to the patient's right screen left. Same thing over here, the carotid arteries are lateral. And then finally, looking at the sagittal sections, we can see that this tumor encompasses the entirety of the cella all the way from the tuberculum down to the clivus. And so the approach, uh, this is an endoscopic approach. Um, and so we'll start by lateralizing the turbinates within the nose. We're in the right nostril here. Um, we'll be able to identify the sphenoid os um, and uh, inject the septum so that we limit our bleeding here. Then we work on the other side, again, identifying the sphenoid os. This is uh, cutting the septal mucosa, uh, so we preserve our olfactory fibers. We'll identify the sphenoid rostrum, uh, which is one of the landmarks in the midline in the nose. We'll do the same thing on the left side. 
And again, we're identifying the sphenoid rostrum here. And then expanding our opening into the sphenoid sinus. We'll fracture the, the sphenoid septation, and you can already start to see the skull base anatomy show itself. So we're removing the septations, and we can see the face of the cella right in the midline, and we're using kerosene rongeurs to open them. Now, the anatomy that we talked about, carotid arteries will be lateral and optic nerves superior here, and we're working right in the midline. So as we unroof the face of the cella, we're always keeping in mind that anatomy so that we don't injure the patient. Now, once we have the cella exposed, we'll... Uh, Doppler insinate the carotid arteries to make sure we know exactly where we are. Um, and then start to open the dura uh, overlying the pituitary gland and pituitary tumor. Now, resection of tumors is, I think, beyond the scope of this talk, um, but basically it's just with a combination of curatage and gentle suction, always being mindful of where you are um, to make sure you don't injure any of the structures that we talked about in the anatomy part of this talk. And so after we curate the tumor, um, one thing I want to show you is to be able to identify the diaphragm, and you can actually just start to see it in that frame there, right here. And that is a cellophane thick uh, membrane that protects CSF from flowing out of the cella from the intracranial compartments. And we'll come back to that. But basically, in this case, uh, there was no evidence of a CSF leak. Uh, we were able to keep that membrane intact and remove the entirety of the tumor, which was uh, eventually proven with postoperative labs. And this patient did great. So that's a direct approach. And that's you know taking into account the anatomy that we learned and just doing surgery inside the cella. Now, what about for tumors that extend beyond the cella? And craniopharyngiomas are a pathology that this is classic for. Now, craniopharyngiomas are technically a WHO grade one tumor, but they are bad actors. Um, and there is a whole host of literature on resection techniques and strategies that I won't get into. Um, but for surgical understanding and planning, um, craniopharyngiomas extend beyond the cella. And so you need to work above the diaphragm, getting into CSF spaces and seeing the anatomy that we just learned about from an a, uh, endonasal perspective. So what we're looking at here is, again, we're parked in the sphenoid sinus. We're looking at the face of the cella. The carotid arteries are lateral. We have the tuberculum in the midline, that's the cliff. And then finally, the planum sphenoid alley right here. So when we're working in a supracellar region, that is called a transtubercular approach. So we're going through the tuberculum. Eventually, to do that, we do need to open both the cella and the tuberculum, but now you know the approach for craniopharyngiomas. So as we open the cella, we shave it down, and that's with a, uh, a sonopet there, and then we start working in the tuberculum. We unroof the face of the cella. And we extend that opening all the way to the carotid arteries bilaterally. And then in a superior part, go above the diaphragm into the supracellar space. Again, we Doppler insinate to make sure we know where the carotids are. And we start by opening the dura and bipolaring the intercavernous sinus uh, to limit the bleeding. Now we're opening into the supracellar space. And in the supracellar space, we know that the optic nerves are gonna be right behind us. So we have to be really mindful of that. This is bipolar coagulation of the inner cavernous sinus to limit bleeding. And you'll see sectioning of that in just a second. And that gives us our window into the cellar and supracellar space. Now you can see as we start to take out tumor and extend that dural opening, the craniopharyngioma comes right into view and it's above the pituitary gland. So you can actually see the normal pituitary gland here and then the tumor extending from the infundibulum. 
And then you'll see that there's gentle dissection to try and dissect that tumor away from the infundibulum. And just above that, we're getting a great view of it. That's the optic chiasm and optic nerves. Um, so when we're working in that supracellar space, again, the anatomy doesn't change, but you just need to be mindful of how it's distorted by the pathology. So in working above the pituitary gland, we know that this tumor is going to be pressing the chiasm superiorly. Um, and so we're careful while we're dissecting not to injure any of the structures that are superior or lateral to that. Now, we'll dissect this tumor away. Ultimately, we will uh, section the infundibulum given the extent of disease. And again, there's a whole host of literature on this, which is worth looking up for those of you who are interested. Um, but uh, we are able to achieve a gross total resection of this tumor. And after the tumor was removed uh, with the capsule from the bottom aspect of the optic chiasm, you can see that the infundibulum is cut right at uh, the entry point into the uh, hypothalamus there. Finally, after sectioning, uh, the infundibulum will begin our reconstruction, um, and we'll get into that in some later slides. So this is the reconstruction that we performed. It was a fat graft with fascial inlay. Uh, we performed cargo net procedure with Surgicel. Um, you can see that we were able to achieve a watertight seal uh, with the CSF pulsating behind it. Um, then finally an onlay, uh, which we again use a cargo net for of Surgicel. And then finally our ENT colleagues placed a nasoceptal flap. And this patient did great without any evidence of postoperative CSF leak. So we've learned the anatomy, we've seen a few examples of surgery, um, and then especially as a medical student, um, it's very helpful to, be, to know what to look for when you're rounding on patients after surgery. So you have to take the whole patient into account, but in your mind, you're thinking of you know, potential complications from this surgery. And because you know the anatomy and where we were working, you know that Postoperative CSF leak, whether the repair failed or was an inadequate repair is a possibility. Because we're working near the infundibulum and posterior aspect of the pituitary gland, that DI and SIADH are also options. Finally, anterior pituitary insufficiency or visual decline, all possible after surgery. And you wanna be mindful to check all of those things. So starting with postoperative CSF leak, how common is it? Well, even in the best of hands, it's about three to 5%. Um, and there was a nice meta-analysis on this published not long ago of 34 uh, studies with over 9,000 patients. And to break it down, uh, they found in this large meta-analysis uh, that larger tumors, those that were firm, that couldn't be suctioned or gently curataged out, those patients with intraoperative CSF leak and a history of prior surgery were all at higher risk for postoperative CSF leak. Now, what are some of the maneuvers to minimize your risk of postoperative CSF leak? Because we'll learn of the morbidity here in a couple slides. So on image left, you'll see an endoscopic view, again, of the cella. This right here is the diaphragm, which is that cellophane wrap layer that protects the CSF from flowing out from the cella. Um, when that is violated, uh, there are multiple options for reconstruction. Even when it's not, you should reconstruct. So on image right, I put together several pictures, um, some from the Atlas, others just from the internet. And you can see that whether you're packing the cella with fat, whether you're using a gasket seal or lumbar drain for CSF diversion or the most aggressive, uh, which is a pedicled nasoceptal flap, all of these are strategies based on the degree of intraoperative CSF leak that you experience. Now, this actually has bro been broken down into grades, and this is how I think about it. Uh, so Dr. Kelly, who's down in Los Angeles, published this in 500 patients. A grade zero meant there was no leak, and that was confirmed by a Valsalva maneuver at the time of surgery. Grade one was a small leak, 
grade two, moderate, and grade three is a large CSF leak. When I think about this, I think of grade zero, grade one, and grade two leaks for direct approaches for tumors of the cella, so things like adenomas or Rathke's cleft cyst. And for those tumors or pathology that extend beyond the cella, so things like craniopharyngioma, which we just saw a video of, or tuberculum cella meningioma, those that will be above the diaphragm and in the CSF space. So those folks will have a grade three leak. And in this series, again, you can see that that is how the, the statistics broke down. So adenomas and RCCs typically had grade zero or grade one leaks because they did not extend into the CSF spaces. So a high flow leak, a grade three leak was exceptionally rare for those pathologies. Now compare that to meningioma or craniopharyngioma or an arachnoid cyst. Those patients had predominantly grade three leaks because they're in the CSF spaces and so when you think about that, you need a strategy of increasing, um, I guess, aggressive nature of repair. So for a grade zero, that is absence of CSF leak, personally, and I learned this from my residency and fellowship, I'll um, obliterate the cella with gel foam and then just do a simple surge of cell repair. Um, I do not place bone uh, as a buttress over the face of the cella. Um, however, with increasing grades of leak, you can increase how aggressive you are with your repair. So you can do fat or fascia grafts. You can do CSF diversion with a lumbar drain or EVD. And then finally, with a high flow leak, you can use a pedicled nasoceptal flap either on your own or with the assistance of your ENT colleagues. Now, in the post-operative period, you want to make sure that your uh, reconstruction holds. And essentially, you want to limit Valsalva maneuvers with that. So with that, you want the patient to have the head of bed up, both when they're awake and sleeping. You don't want them bearing, de bearing down. So the patient should have laxatives during their inpatient and postoperative period. Um, you don't want them bending over, no heavy lifting, um, and limiting emesis events. So we made it a practice to really limit opioids uh, in our post-operative patients because of the known risk of uh, nausea and vomiting with them. Now, how about managing CSF leak if it occurs? Well, first thing, and as a student, this is incredibly helpful. You wanna confirm that it's a CSF leak and you do that by tilting the patient forward, touching the chin to the chest, and it has to be like water drops, like a faucet coming out. And you have to see it for yourself. You can, get a, you can start with a CT scan to look for pneumocephalus. And then again, you just increase stepwise how aggressive you are with your repair. Some folks will start with temporary CSF diversion, whether that be a lumbar drain or EVD. And then some will go straight back to the OR for primary repair. Now, why is it important to identify this and fix it? Well, you can have significant morbidity from CSF leaks. In one study, uh, over a study period of 12 years, the risk of meningitis was 20% in their series of 116 patients. Um, and that is too high um, to not do anything about. And so when you suspect CSF leak, you wanna be very aggressive in working it up. The next thing you want to look for when you're rounding in the postoperative period is postoperative diabetes insipidus. Um, and this can occur when the pituitary gland is stunned or injured, um, and the pituitary doesn't make enough ADH, and therefore you have significant diuresis um, and increase in your serum sodium concentration. And again, this is related to either stunning or injury to the pituitary stalk or posterior aspect of the gland. Now, how common is it? Well, that's actually a really tough question to answer because if you look in the literature, there are numerous definitions uh, for diabetes insipidus. And this study published in neurosurgery um, they found that in their series of 110 patients that the incidence of permanent DI was 
whereas the incidence of just transient DI was up upwards of 25%. And so you will see it commonly in postoperative patients. And this is the criteria that I generally go by. Uh, it's a clinical diagnosis. So I start with the urine production of greater than 300 cc's in an hour for three consecutive hours, and then check urine labs and serum sodium um, to confirm that. Now, it's important to recognize this and also to be on top of the labs that you're checking for this. The reason for this is that because there is a common phenomenon called a triple phase where a patient will start in DI and then after several days will fall into SIADH or syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion and then return back to DI and eventually level out. And as you remember from the first couple of years of medical school, that the treatment for DI and SIADH are essentially polar opposites. So you want to make sure that you know the diagnosis at that specific time and you're treating appropriately. The reason for that, so the treatment for DI is essentially to drink to thirst, to, treat, to keep up with the volume loss uh, that's happening because of the extensive diuresis. Now, a, you know, um, DDAVP can be given if they can't keep up uh, with fluid intake, but we always start with just making sure the patient knows to drink to thirst and the body has um, mechanisms to tell you that. So in DI, the patient drinks to thirst. However, after a couple of days, the patient will swing into SIADH. And if the patient continues to drink um, with the, well, while they're in SIADH, their sodium can plummet and it beca can become life-threatening. Um, so you absolutely want to identify that and know the sodium and how it's trending uh, in the day-to-day -day management of these patients. Finally, several days after SIADH, DI will eventually resume and then eventually the patient will normalize out. So very, very important to be able to recognize this and know how to treat appropriately. The treatment for SIADH is fluid restriction. So you do not want the patient drinking water while they're in SIADH. It will only compound the problem. Postoperative adrenal insufficiency is very rare for direct approaches uh, when the gland and infundibulum is not injured. Um, we typically check a post-op day one cortisol to assess for this. And if they need temporary hydrocortisone replacement, we can give that to them. Um, in patients where we're doing extended approaches for, say, a craniopharyngioma where the stalk may need to be sectioned, those patients absolutely need to be on hydrocortisone and important to recognize that and confirm that they're actually getting the medication. Now, finally, uh, postoperative visual outcomes um, are generally very, very good uh, for direct and extended approaches. Upwards of 80% of folks will have improvement in their vision, um, with about half of those having complete recovery. Um, it is unlikely for a patient to have visual decline after surgery, and if that is identified in your postoperative checks or in the days after surgery, that's absolutely something that needs to be brought up to your residents and the attending, um, because that can be considered a surgical emergency. Now, when we think about tumors, again, relating this back to our anatomy, adenomas, craniopharyngiomas, and others, when they grow from the cella or paracellar region, they often compress the optic chiasm upwards. And these nerves are exquisitely sensitive to any kind of pressure. So what you'll typically see with this is a bitemporal hemianopsia. And I know that pretty much every student on this call knows that. It's, it's drilled into us from day one of medical school. And this is what your common visual field looks like. If you were just to look in the left eye uh, versus the right eye, and then when your brain uh, conforms these and has binocular vision, that is your visual field. But with bitemporal hemianopsia, you lose the temporal components of your visual field. And so when they're combined, you essentially have tunnel vision. And the severity of this really depends on the amount of compression on the optic chiasm. Now, why does this happen? Well, if we look at the actual, uh, the actual um, wiring of the nerves going from the retina back to um, the occipital lobe, 
you can see that the nasal fields, um, so the nasal aspect of the retina looking into the temporal fields bilaterally cross, and those cross at the chiasm, whereas those on the temporal side looking into the nasal field do not cross at the chiasm. So when you have a midline lesion compressing the middle of the optic chiasm, it is the crossing fibers that are affected, and that's why you lose the peripheral vision. So if you do have post-operative visual decline, I consider this a surgical emergency. Potential causes can be injury to the optic chiasm during surgery, can be overpacking from reconstruction, can be related to vasospasm or infarction um, of the pituitary gland with associated panhypopituitarism and pressure on the bottom aspect of the optic chiasm. Workup for this will depend on the timing that of this happening, um, but can include urgent imaging, uh, fast return to the operating room, uh, urgent pituitary labs, or stress dose hydrocortisone. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.